All animals with a nervous system respond to touch. All of them. It's that important. Even single-celled organisms have some semblance of touch. It's the simplest form of life, and it can feel things. Cell membranes and nuclei, they're just filled with some cytoplasm, and if you poke them, they will react. Even paramecium will move away from the poke. Plants, you might think of them as just these things that sit over there in the corner of your house or outside where you probably can't go right now. Even plants move when responding to touch. The idea of physical interaction is ingrained in our very cells, in our very being. When the world was utterly silent, touch was already there. When the world was dark and we couldn't see anything and we couldn't taste anything because there was no taste and there was no smell yet, touch was already a thing. Touch was the first sense. And yet we know very little about it. Touch is the final frontier for sensory neuroscience because animals needed to evolve it. And why did we evolve to touch? Cells needed to grope around in the water of the world to find nutrients, no oxygen, no light, just feeling around, floating and pushing their way through the ancient seas. And yet, even with all that, we didn't really start to get into touch and research into not touching until after World War II. Scientists realized skin hunger or touch deprivation was a thing. Okay, let's kick into it. Hi, 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 I am Trace. Welcome back, physical beings. This is Uno Dose of Trace, and thank you for returning. If you are new, this is episode three in a series of five, so watch this, sure, please do, please don't go anywhere, just stick around and watch. But I will be referring to stuff that's already happened, so if you haven't watched all the episodes in this series, go back and watch those too. So far, we've talked about where touch lives in the brain and the body, and what touch really means to us, and it turns out it means a lot. And also, today, then we're gonna talk about what happens when we don't touch each other. Have you touched someone recently? If you haven't, and you have the opportunity to, would you take it? Do you find yourself daydreaming about touching another person? Not in a sexual way, just wanting a hug, or a handshake, or a high five, or a slap on the back. Wanting to sit next to someone at a restaurant, and just feeling them there physically, being next to you. They may not even physically touch you that often, like just their shoulder bumping against yours. But it almost feels like you know you're real then, right? Now, touch deprivation is really interesting because it essentially means you want to be touched. You want physical contact. This is something that I think a lot of us are experiencing for the first time, but there are communities on this planet, in this world, in our countries, in our homes maybe, that experience this often. Think about communities of people who are disabled. They might not be able to get physical contact when they want it. They might not be able to have a hug. They may never be able to feel their own body in the same way as someone who isn't disabled. Skin hunger and touch deprivation is a common topic amongst the disabled community. And so if anything, we should empathize with them who experience it more now, because many of us now understand what it's like. After World War II, there were controversial experiments by Harry Harlow. He separated baby rhesus macaques from their mothers, and he gave those baby rhesus macaques two options. A mannequin macaque with a bottle of milk that was made of wire and wood, or a mannequin macaque with no milk made of cloth. And then they wanted to see what the macaques would do. Watch. Wow. And the baby macaques went to the cloth one with no food. They got no reward of food from going to that, but they wanted it, they needed it. They needed touch. That is skin hunger. Infants also need this, they need touch. They need it as much as they need food and water, say child development specialists. Skin hunger was studied again in orphanages after the fall of communism in Romania. It turns out they didn't have enough people to take care of the babies. They weren't hugged, they weren't cuddled, they weren't loved in that way, physically. Neurologist David Linden told Vox, quote, they were depressed and had high instances of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder as they got older. They also had problems physically. They had physical ailments like weakened immune systems and skin ailments. And this was just because they believed 
that they weren't touched as babies. This is why NICU babies and preemies are still taken out of their incubators and environments of safety and, and they take them out, even though that might be considered dangerous, and they take them out and they put them against another human's skin. Studies have shown this skin contact can affect body image with touch as a child, violence in adolescence. Humans, they need touch. And skin hunger is that feeling that you just, you just need to touch someone. And I'm sorry if I'm making that worse by talking about it so much, but I think it's important. And I think it's important that we hear from people who understand it. So with that in mind, I have a guest our first one of this series, my friend Diana Klatt. She is an epidemiologist. She posted something about touch deprivation on her Instagram, so I called her. My name is Diana. I am an epidemiologist. I do data analytics, but also science communication. And you can find me at the podcast Global Caveat and on Instagram at Clattalist and in the deep world of Epi Twitter at Diana Clapp. You posted a thing about touch deprivation, which was so great. So I wanted to call you and talk about it. I think it's a no brainer saying that physical touch is the thing that is going to just forever be changed, right? Like Dr. Fauci said that he thinks that Americans should never shake hands again, which is just wild when you think about that, because so many people shake hands the minute they greet each other, especially here in the U.S. People in Europe, especially Italians, are so used to greeting each other with like the cheek kisses and everything. And they obviously can't do that now because that's even more contact with like spit and stuff, right, versus just shaking hands. It's definitely interesting and with more people using social media and more people using technology, we were already decreasing the amount we touch each other. And even though we don't touch a lot in the US, I think that people don't recognize how much they actually do touch people when they're engaging with people in like in-person meetings or at lunch or dinners or having coffee with people, like just a you know graze on the arm or something or laughing and touching someone or like showing condolence or trying to comfort someone, you're still touching them a little bit. You might not be like, super touchy and not everyone is very touchy, but there are still elements of touch in our day-to-day -day lives. Have you noticed touching in your own life that has kind of diminished and how do you feel about that? The last time I gave someone a hug was actually before recording this. Um, before the pandemic, I was not a very touchy person. Um, at all. And I felt that at the very beginning, because I, I did live alone before, and I moved to go live with friends instead, it was really getting to me to not be around anyone. Like I had gone to visit my mom, and I stood across the yard from her without a being able to touch her. And that was really difficult for me. And since I have now been living with friends, it's made a huge difference. But also I have found that I am much more frequently like hugging people, because I just feel like I need something to help reduce the stress because I'm definitely more anxious in my day-to-day -day life. At the very beginning of when this got upgraded from an epidemic to a pandemic, I was living alone, that I started acting very strangely, but not necessarily, it's not just because like I'm a strange individual, whatever, um, but because I didn't know what to do with myself and I felt like I needed to continuously do things. So I started cleaning a lot more which required me to like touch a lot of things, right? And I actually polished my floors twice, like my wooden floor, so they would be slippery. And I feel like that's not quite a normal thing, but it really felt nice to have that completely different texture or that different like feeling on the bottom of my foot. But you know, also afterwards I polished my floor twice, a friend offered for me to come stay with them and I immediately did that so I wouldn't be alone, which I think makes a huge difference for me personally. Like if I had to continue being alone, I don't know how I would feel. Touch doesn't have to be like intimate or sexual, like touch can be anything, right? There's a lot of different ways to have meaningful touch. And I think that's like a very important thing to make clear is that people frequently conflate the two, like sexual intimacy and touch, but there's meaningful touch is so important in so many different aspects. How does someone know they have touch deprivation? I feel like it's going to present itself differently in everyone, right? So not everyone is going to react the same way. Right now, a lot of people are feeling loneliness in general. And I think that if you are experiencing loneliness, but it feels deeper, and I don't know how to describe that better than saying if it's like deeper, or achy, or like concerning to you, that it might not just be from the fact that you're alone. Um, for other people, it might show up in like, maybe they start having more obsessive behaviors, 
Um, so maybe like how I said earlier that I was cleaning a lot, like maybe you start cleaning a lot because you need to do something. And that's a very tactile thing, right? Cleaning or other like touchy behaviors or fidgeting. You're like holding something a lot. It could be because you're trying to stimulate some kind of touch sensation. And I say this coming from a place of like, this is how I was feeling when I was like living alone before I chose to come stay with friends um, because I felt that aching. Right. And I, I'm someone that I enjoy having time to recover and recharge alone. Uh, but getting to be with other people and like you said, you know, getting to choose when to recover alone or be around other people made a huge difference for me. But I noticed that like aching feeling deep inside of me in terms of loneliness and being like, this is such a loneliness that I like, I started crying. Right. Because a huge aspect of physical touch is it helps reduce your stress. So increased levels of stress, it makes sense because you have nothing to help, you know, increase the amount of oxytocin and endorphins and everything else that helps you feel good and relieve your stress being produced in your body that you would normally get from touch. When I was in school for physical therapy, one of the things that we were told to do was to keep a quarter in our pocket to help increase our ability to touch things like and be able to palpate different muscles. So in order to increase our sensitivity at our fingertips, we used to like try to make out every single letter on a quarter in your pocket. And that can just increase your amount of sensation just by touching the same thing over and over again, or very intensely thinking about what you're touching or trying to feel for something. And there's a lot of like, just even on a surface of, you know, a quarter, there's a lot of different feeling. So like that's definitely something. Or everyone can just get an old phone and practice T9 again and texting oh. that when you feel the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> Something else you could consider doing, especially for those that are living alone, is to get a weighted blanket. That's something you can do to help with the feeling of like the compression from a hug. I'm definitely hugging every single person once I can, even if that means that I have to be completely like clothed in something. <laughs> <laughs> But you can also hug yourself, you know, and think about that. Um, those are different ways that you can feel that. I think this is still great. You know, you still get the compression and also a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> so. so to wrap, something that I've been thinking about a lot is empathy. I mentioned it earlier. Maybe we'll have more empathy for people once we get out of this situation and we can touch more. We can be around others more. But the thing that I keep coming back to is people who experience this all the time. I mentioned earlier communities who may not be able to experience touch when they want or may never be able to experience physical touch because of their physicality, their bodies, their location. But something that I think anybody, and it would include this population, but anybody can experience, and that is prison, jail, being under arrest. We've been inside our houses for days, months, weeks at a time. This is not unlike somebody who is confined to an area, under house arrest or in prison. But we trap people in places, we jail them. And many Americans don't believe that that is enough of a punishment. Now that you have been in your house for as long as you have, you can't go to Baskin Robbins. Is asking you not to leave enough of a punishment? Do I also need to deny you good food and entertainment and camaraderie and social time? Things that people complain about, that prisons have, because it's good for mental health. Can you empathize more with a prisoner than you used to be able to? Now, just with the very light version of this? Imagine if not only you couldn't leave your house, but your house was only one room. Imagine if you could only leave that one room when told. That's horrifying to think about now, especially. I mean, at least for me, I can really empathize with people who are trapped in a place that they cannot leave. And that is a huge, huge punishment all on its own. Why would we want people to suffer even more? Can't we empathize more now with that? I would hope that as a society, we can now empathize with people who are in jail, who are in prison, that cannot leave. They're in this quarantine situation every day, times 10, times 100. Touch is so important that it actually boosts our immune system. According to a 2014 study reported by Time Magazine, quote, whether receiving hugs and more broadly social support gives the perception that one is cared for, it could make people less susceptible to one of the viruses and common colds. They actually had 404 adults who self-reported their 
feelings for two weeks. And then they physically exposed the, the adults to cold virus on purpose, which is so crazy. They had social support of them and that social support was monitored and more social support meant that they were less likely to come down with the cold. That's how much social interaction can affect people. Video chatting, like what we're all doing now. It releases bonding hormones and happy feelings just like physical touch does, though it's not perfect. I think we all can feel that now that we've done it for a while. It's not a perfect replacement to interacting with human beings in person, but it is a little bit of an analog. So video chatting and phone calls uh, can reduce reduce the like touch deprivation and help replace it in terms of like social connection by like 70 to 80 percent and you see that a lot of times with people that are in long distance relationships right like people are very capable of using this as their primary way of connecting and maintaining like deep connections this might not necessarily be a tip for your work colleagues unless you're already close with your work colleagues carving out some time to ask about how people are doing and like what what they've been up to or like what's making them happy uh, but it definitely helps to be able to like share those things with people and also just you know maybe reach out to someone you haven't talked to in a while or maybe someone you usually just have like texting conversations with you can just be like hey are you free for a video chat or a call and like that could definitely increase the amount of social connection you're getting versus texting. Although texting is very like tactile, even though we're all on smooth screens. Do something that isn't just sitting with your face in the middle of the screen. Dance, sing, exercise, play games. If you are lucky enough to have someone around that you can touch, a brother, a mother, a dog, <laughs> a partner, touch that person, give them a hug, shake their hands. I'm sure you're already doing it without thinking about it, but make sure you do it and think about it at the same time. Be on the couch, let your limbs touch each other. It's fine, do it. It's not sexual, it's just physical contact. If you have an animal, pet that animal, touch it, play with it, wrestle with it if it's big enough. It's good for you. If you're by yourself, touch things in your house, your couch, your wall, your floor, your bed. You have a plant, touch the leaves of your plant. Touch different surfaces, lift things, be tactile. It's not a replacement for touching another human, but it will help settle your touch debt. Your skin hunger will be lessened because of it. Now that we know how physical contact works and what happens in the brain and what happens in our emotional centers and why it's important to touch, let's find some stories about how touching can change over time. The next episode is gonna be really cool because we're gonna start talking about touch illusions, what happens with people who cannot touch, like physically they're, they're, they're kept from touching others. And I have a really amazing interview that I'm very excited about with an astronaut who spent a lot of time in space and couldn't touch another person. So. Subscribe to get all the episodes in the series. Make sure you go back and watch the episodes if you didn't already of the first two sections of this. And of course, I am Trace, and I thank you for tuning in. I'll see you in the future.